Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prestaya Bhutale Shrimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namane Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Pracharane Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Pastyatya Dejatarane Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhunitya Ananda Sri Advaita Gadadha Shivasari Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hari 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 Rama Hari Rama 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 Hari Hari Vanchikalpa Trilubhyas Cha Kripa Sindhu Bhya Eva Cha Padjitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha Hare Krishna So welcome devotees Welcome to our continuing discussion on Nectar of Instruction verse 10 so first of all, as usual, uh, we will read the verse to remind ourselves what is the subject matter. And as I said last night, uh, the Sanskrit, the, the rhythm meter is difficult, but anyway, we'll try. Karma bhya parito hare priyataya vyaktim ya yoginas. Te Vyogyana Vimukta Bhakti Parama Premaika Nishtastata Te Vyasta Pashu Pala Pankaja Drishashta Vyopi Saradika Preshta Tadvad Iyam Tadiya Sarasitam Nashrayat Kakriti <coughs> Okay, so that was the verse and here's the translation. Uh, in the Shastra, it is said that of all types of fruit of workers, he who is advanced in knowledge of the higher values of life is favored by the Supreme Lord Hari. Out of many such people who are advanced in knowledge, jnanis, one who is practically liberated by virtue of his knowledge may take to devotional service. He is superior to the others. However, one who has actually attained prema, pure love of Krishna, is superior to him. The gopis are exalted above all the advanced devotees because they are always totally dependent upon Sri Krishna, the transcendental cowherd boy. Among the gopis, Srimati Radharani is the most dear to Krishna. Her kund, lake, is as profoundly dear to Lord Krishna as this most beloved of the gopis. Who then will not reside at Radhakund and in a spiritual body surcharged with ecstatic devotional feelings, a prakrita bhava, render loving service to the divine couple Sri Sri Radha Govinda who perform their Ashtakaliya Leela, their eternal eightfold daily pastimes. Indeed, those who execute devotional service on the banks of Radha Kund are the most fortunate people in the universe. <coughs> Hare Krishna. Yes, of course, we can note, I didn't really note so much yesterday, but we can definitely note that Srila Rupa Goswami in the verse talks of residing at Radha Kund in a spiritual body that is not like one of ours. It's a Satchitananda spiritual body surcharged with ecstatic devotional feelings. Aprakrita Bhava. Aprakrita Bhava means, well, Bhava means Bhava, ecstasy the beginnings of love of Krishna. And aprakrita means uh, not material. Prakrita means material. Prakrita sahajya means materialistic person who takes things cheaply. But aprakrita bhava, this is, this is pure bhava. All right, so we, th there are five categories of persons to be discussed and we discussed 
the particular, uh, the first particular category, the uh, the materialistic people, the karmis, and we heard that actually there there are many different types of karmis, materialists, who basically want to enjoy the senses in this lifetime with this body on this planet or in the case of some to go to higher planets to enjoy the senses there. So, but um, Srila Prabhupada, well the verse in fact, the verse in fact said that amongst those people, those, those who have a sort of a higher sense, some sort of higher sense, uh, advanced in knowledge of the higher values of life, as Rupa Goswami said in the verse, is, is favored by the Lord. So though those who are pious and who are performing religious activities, even though they're trying to go to higher planets for material enjoyment, but because they are following some Vedic system and there's some worship there, and even generally there'll be some worship of the Supreme Lord, at least Lord Vishnu. So basically, the Supreme Personality of Godhead is a little pleased with them. Not too much, <laughs> but it's definitely better than nothing which is the case with the gross materialists. So this brings us on to paragraph three. Uh, and I've analyzed, it's pretty obvious, that paragraphs three, four, and five are talking about the jnani. The jnani, uh, who of course is also mentioned there in the verse, obviously, uh, out of many such people who advanced in knowledge, jnanis, uh, one who is practically liberated by virtue of his knowledge may take to devotional service. Well, that's sort of combining the, the general idea of a jnani who's someone who's into knowledge and is generally an impersonalist. And one such person who somehow becomes attracted to Krishna consciousness. So Srila Prabhupada discusses this uh, in uh, paragraphs 3, 4, and 5, and it's, it's very nice. Uh, the basic idea, well, Prabhupada begins, one should therefore be eager to understand the science of the soul, atma tattva. Yeah, and, and not, one sh why should one therefore be eager. One should therefore be eager because um, if, you, if you don't do that, if you just remain on the material level, pious or impious, then you'll have to take birth again, maybe in a higher planet, but somewhere in the material world. And who knows what will come to you? Yeah. So, so therefore, uh, one should be eager, Prabhupada says at the beginning of, of paragraph 3, to understand the science of the soul, atma tattva, what is the truth of the soul. Uh, and otherwise, Prabhupada says, otherwise, you're in ignorance. You're just in ignorance. Different versions of ignorance. Some, some versions are sort of better <laughs> in a certain sense than other forms of ignorance, but they're all forms of ignorance, and ignorance can never be good. Uh, so, and the basic point, the basic point, we're, we're in the third paragraph, the basic point, and it's, you know, it's one of our most simple, if not, not the most simple points in the whole of Krishna consciousness, right from the beginning of Bhagavad Gita, that basically means we should understand we are not these bodies. We're eternal spirit soul. And then one should try to cultivate that knowledge 
and that practice to kind of separate yourself from your body and material existence. But, but at this stage, the jnani who's being talked about is not a devotee. It's all just not the body, I'm the soul, I'm not part of the material world. So it's kind of impersonal. And as we have mentioned before in this seminar, uh, more often than not, or even generally, the term jnani is used to refer to an impersonalist. This is definitely a fact. Aha! Uh -huh. so, so that jnani, Prabhupada goes on to explain, you know, the basic points, which we all know, that, that the jnani knows that material activities they're not good for me, I must avoid them. Otherwise, I'll get caught up in material life again. And what will my future be? So, uh, so therefore, the jnani avoids materialism and is always in a renounced position and in a position of philosophical understanding who am I? What am I? What is this world? And how I am not part of this world like this. And therefore, if we go, when we go on to the fourth paragraph, Prabhupada begins by saying, thus a jnani, uh, thus a jnani is considered superior to a karmi because he at least refrains from the blind activities of sense enjoyment. And this is the verdict of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Now that's interesting. That's interesting. Prabhupada's making a reference to the Supreme Lord in this regard. Uh, he doesn't actually mention where, where it's coming from, but he just says, you know, that's, that's Krishna's verdict that the jnani is better than the karmi because the jnani knows uh, that I don't get into sense gratification. It's not for me. It's like poison to me. Yeah, so therefore he's superior to the karmi and the Supreme Lord confirms this. And where do you think he confirms this? Well, he confirms it uh, if you look down at the, the, the uh, what is it, fifth paragraph, the next paragraph, Prabhupada quotes Bhagavad Gita 7.19. Uh, yeah, and that's a famous verse. And it actually appears in the uh, sequence of verses which Prabhupada is sort of indirectly referring to in the previous paragraph 4 by saying, this is the verdict of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Um, yeah. So, mm hmm. All right, let's, let's just go into that. We're, we're sort of going from... Well, let me, let me, before we do this, I'm going to refer back to this point when we go a little bit into this verse 7, 9, 10. But going back to paragraph 4, just after Prabhupada makes that reference to the verdict of the Lord, um, Prabhupada then gives a sort of disclaimer about the jnanis. It means that, you know, life is not so hot. Life is not so wonderful if you're a jnani, and, and you're not so wonderful if you're a jnani, uh, who's not a devotee, particularly. So Prabhupada says that even, even though a jnani may be liberated in a certain sense, above the level of the karamis and their sense gratification, and their having to take birth again, because of that, um, but unless he comes to the platform of devotional service, 
he's still in ignorance. Not so, not as bad as the karmis. No, he's still a jnani. He's still knowledgeable. I'm not this body. I'm the soul. He's developing that knowledge. He, he's renouncing this world. But he's still in ignorance to some degree. If he's not a devotee of the Lord yet. Aha. Uh -huh. And in fact, that knowledge he has... If, if, there, if it doesn't include knowledge of Krishna, it's considered impure. Prabhupada says this, that here at, at the end of the fourth paragraph, if you've got the book there. Because he's got no information of devotional service, etc. And there is a very famous verse, <coughs> which I want to read to you right now. It's Srimad Bhagavatam 10 Two, thirty-two, And I will just read the translation. O lotus-eyed Lord, although devotees who accept severe austerities and penances to achieve the highest position may think themselves liberated, that's these jnanis, it's Lord Brahma speaking, and he's speaking about these same jnanis that we've just been talking about the last some number of minutes. Okay, so these non-devotees, they accept severe austerities and penances to achieve the highest position. Although they may think themselves liberated, their intelligence is impure. They fall down from their position of imagined superiority because they have no regard for your lotus feet. So what is the idea here of impure intelligence uh, in, in the verse from the Bhagavatam? And Prabhupada says, uh, impure knowledge. What, what is the point there? I mean, what, what's the idea behind that? The idea is that because that jnani thinks that the supreme is is impersonal and uses his or her intelligence to come up with all sorts of different philosophical ideas and arguments and to prove that the absolute truth is impersonal, to prove that I'm this body, and in many cases to prove that everything is Brahman. Well, it's not exactly like that, is it? The absolute truth is not something impersonal. The absolute truth is Krishna. And the activities in relation to the absolute truth, Krishna, those activities are activities of devotional service and not just sort of speculation, knowledge, about the soul and the world and the differences and me, how I'm not part of it and trying to separate, detach myself. So you get the idea. It's impure knowledge. They think this is the supreme, but it's not. It's contaminated by the impersonal conception, which is untrue. All right. Aha. Uh -huh. So then that takes us on into paragraph 5, which has this, the verse 719 in it. So sometimes a jnani may take to devotional service. Uh, here Prabhupada doesn't really get into how, but anyway, it may happen. It happens sometimes that some jnani who's otherwise basically an impersonalist gets the association of devotees. Yeah, and something touches their heart and they start changing. We mentioned, I think last night, was it? One of the nights we mentioned about uh, Lord Chaitanya meeting Prakashananda Saraswati in Varanasi and having a sort of a debate discussion with him. And Lord Chaitanya being Lord Chaitanya, 
was able to present Krishna consciousness in such incredibly brilliant, powerful and cutting ways that Prakashananda, who had been the leader of the Mayavadis, and he had 60,000 disciples, Mayavadis, uh, he became a devotee and all his followers became devotees. Yeah. But, but sometimes jnanis or impersonalists become devotees. Uh, you may have heard of um, Shukadev Goswami. I mean, yeah, I mean, you've heard of him, but you may have heard of how he became a devotee. He was an impersonalist. Uh, and he was in his mother's womb, the wife of Vyasadeva, because he's the son of Vyasadeva. Uh, and he didn't want to come out because he thought, if I come out, outside it's all Maya. And Vyasadeva said, well, look, in my, in my wife's womb is Maya too. But uh, Shugadev said, well, this is an easier Maya to deal with. <laughs> and because he was impersonally realized, he didn't mind the sort of very uncomfortable position there. He didn't really feel it so much. So he was okay to stay there and he stayed there 16 years. But eventually Vyasadev had Lord Krishna come and, and promise Shukadev, you will not fall down into material life if you come out. And Shukadev came out. But he was an impersonalist. But then he heard Srimad Bhagavatam from Srila Vyasadev and he became a devotee. The four Kumars, they were, they were really impersonalists. I mean, Shukadev was too, but they were full impersonalists. But they got the association of Narada Muni, <coughs> who described the Supreme Lord to them, and they became really attracted. And so they went to Vaikuntha to meet him, and it's a long story, but they met him and they became devotees. So, uh, Prabhupada says, when a jnani takes to devotional service, he rapidly becomes superior to an ordinary jnani, means the impersonal style one. And, and then they, they take to devotional service and chapter 7 verse 19 of Bhagavad Gita applies. But I wanted to mention also, that's, that's verse 19 of chapter 7. Let me, let me just read a couple of verses before that. Well, first of all, Krishna explains in, in 7.16, I think, yeah, 7.16. Four types of pious people may begin to render devotional service to him. The distressed, the desirous of wealth, the inquisitive, and someone who's really searching for knowledge of the absolute. And the, term, the Sanskrit term which is used in the verse is jnani. So then Lord Krishna goes on to say that of these, the one who's in full knowledge and is always engaged in pure devotional service is the best. For I'm very dear to him and he is very dear to me. Yeah. And then Krishna goes on with verse 19, after many births and deaths, he who is actually in knowledge surrenders unto me, knowing me to be the cause of all causes and all that is. Such a great soul is very rare. Yeah. <clears throat> so the jnani becomes a really qualified, proper jnani when he or she becomes a devotee. So then we move on to the next paragraph. It's only small, uh, but it's again another one of the categories uh, from the verse. It's the prema bhakta. Prema bhakta. 
And this is just only this little uh, paragraph six. You know, if, you, if you've got your book, you can see it's just a few lines long. So, so let me just read it, actually. After taking the devotional service under the regulative principles, a person may come to the platform of spontaneous love of Godhead. Following in the footsteps of great devotees like Narada and Sanaka and Sanatan, the Supreme Personality of Godhead then recognizes him to be superior. The devotees who have developed love of God, Prema, Krishna Prema, are certainly in an exalted position. Well, of course. So, you know, Prabhupada has just taken us from just surrendering to Krishna to Krishna Prema in, a, in a, few, a few sentences, two sentences even. Uh, yeah. So, you know, he, we, we have already in Nectar of Instruction been through the step-by-step -step process. I'm not going to repeat it. There is one point I want to make, though, and it's touched on here that the idea, of course, ultimately, at least one way of seeing the idea, is to go back to Godhead or come to the level of Krishna Prema. Uh, and, and of course, one begins in the beginning. All of us, myself included, you know, I have started on the level of trying to start 16 rounds and it wasn't easy for a little while until I sort of got the hang of it. So, so everyone begins at the beginning, you could say. I mean, if, if someone left their body before becoming perfect, in the next life they won't begin at the beginning, they'll begin where they left off. But anyway, you, you begin. You begin from somewhere. And as Prabhupada says, you take to devotional service under the regulative principles. This is Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti. But then, some few days ago, we read a bit about Raganuga Sadhana Bhakti. I hope, I hope you know, you were able to grasp it. It is all a bit, you know, you know, a bit certainly beyond our realization. Although it's important to at least have a basic idea what's going on there. So there's Raganuga Sadhana Bhakti, uh, if you remember, where you follow someone who has rag. Rag meaning such an attraction and attachment to the Lord, you, you forget he's God. And he, you just see him in terms of the rasa, friendly rasa, conjugal rasa. And you don't see him in terms of being God, practically at all or hardly ever at least. That is Raganuga. And that rag is what kind of obscures the fact that Krishna is God, the rag, the attraction, and the love. But then there are other devotees, particularly there are devotees in Vaikuntha, and actually there are also devotees in uh, Vai um, uh, Dwaraka, in Dwaraka, there are some devotees with rag, some without. But Vaikuntha, it's all without. So how did they get from the beginning under the regulative principles, how did they get to Vaikuntha, back home, back to Godhead, uh, without going through Raganuga? Isn't that an interesting question? Because Raganuga is basically only for people whose eternal relationship is in Goloka Vrindavan. Uh, and, and they have to be trained how to do that particular service, which is their eternal service, because they forgot many years in this world. But, there, but then there's the Vaikuntha planets, and there's also Dwaraka for that matter, and even Mathura. 
where rag generally is less common and less strong. Yeah. So what happens with them? They don't, but in Vaikuntha there is no rag. There's great awe and reverence and respect that this is the Supreme Lord and I am his humble devotee. Yeah, and there's, there's none of this attraction forgetting he's God and he's now he's just becoming my friend or anything like nothing like that. So the process there is that they, those devotees, just go on in Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti through Nishta, through Ruchi Asakti, and then they become, come to the level of Bhava through Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti, meaning the practice of devotional service under rules and regulations, and they continue according to rules and regulations, uh, but in a mood now of love, actual love, and not just a taste or, you know, some steadiness, but actual love. Anyway, that we digressed a little for that, but I thought we should mention it. All righty. So that was paragraph six. Now we go on to paragraph seven. And seven's interesting uh, because, well, what do we have here? Um, uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, seven is, it's sort of like, would we say the first half? About the first half of paragraph seven is discussing the gopis who are like the best amongst the devotees in Prema. And the other half of paragraph seven goes into the discussion about Radharani. I mean, you know, Prabhupada did not make the paragraphs. If it had been me, I would have split it, made a paragraph where we go from the gopis to Radharani. But anyway, and then, so the gopis then are discussed in the first half of paragraph seven, which begins, of all these devotees, the gopis are recognized as superior. Yes, uh, and why? Because they don't know anything other than satisfying Krishna. Uh, they don't expect any return from Krishna. This is pure devotional service. Now, of course, you know, pure devotional service, this term can be used in, in a few ways, at least, shall we say. And even Prabhupada said that his disciples are pure devotees. But here, when, we say, when we're saying pure, devotional, pure devotees, we mean just the absolute topmost, absolute topmost. So the gopis are like that. They're, they're like that. And, and even Krishna, sometimes Krishna, Prabhupada makes the point, when Krishna left Vrindavan for Mathura, the go gopis became dejected and they simply cried for the rest of their lives. But still, they didn't give up Krishna. Their love was so great that for years and years they were in pain, but they never gave up Krishna. So, yeah. Uh, let's see, let's see. Okay, then Prabhupada, let's see, where are we here? Now, we are in, ah, we are there. We are in paragraph seven. Yes, we are. 
And Prabhupada says, let me just read, it's right in the middle of paragraph 7. When Krishna left Vrindavan for Mathura, the gopis became most dejected and spent the rest of their lives simply crying in separation from Krishna. This means that in one sense they were never actually separated from Krishna. There is no difference between thinking of Krishna and associating with him. Rather, Vipralamba Seva, thinking of Krishna in separation, as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu did, is far better than serving Krishna directly. Yeah. So let us just clarify a little bit, a little bit. What is this idea of devotional service and separation and, and, and it being, you know, far better than serving Krishna directly, as Prabhupada puts it, and in fact, Lord Chaitanya Charitam, Chaitanya Charitamrita, uh, they all put it like that. Here's an idea, here's an idea, just to give an idea, that when, when the gopis or anyone, uh, one of the bridge buses most exalted, Vrindavan devotees, when they're with Krishna, then they, they can get so, they, so close they can embrace. And when they embrace, they can embrace really hard. As Lord Chaitanya said, um, what did he say? That whether you crush me in your embrace. Woo. You know, some super hard embrace. Whether you crush me or you, or you leave me alone, make me broken hearted. You're always my worshipful Lord. But the thing is, when you're separated from Krishna, when, when you're with Krishna, the tendency is to become absorbed in the presence of Krishna. On him, as he is there, standing in front of you. When he's not there and you're, in and you're in separation, then you think about him. And when you think about him, he is there. It's not just some sort of abstract daydream. When you think about Krishna, he is there. And when you become deeply absorbed in thinking of him, as the gopis and, and so many other devotees do in separation, then he is within you and, and his presence within you is very strong. So he is, so to, seeing he's within you, it's more intimate and, and it's closer than just embracing him outside of you. So in that sense, it's possible to get, have a little idea of how separation may be a higher experience because Krishna is specifically and entirely within you. He's not at all outside of you. But when he is there personally with you and you're talking and doing whatever together, then there's the tendency to become absorbed in him externally. While, of course, one is thinking about him, but still to become absorbed in his presence externally. So that's an interesting little idea. Interesting little idea. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. So then the paragraph 7 goes on, we're sort of halfway through it or whatever, to talking about Radharani who is the topmost of the gopis. And... Yeah. Thus, of all the devotees who have developed unalloyed lo devotional love for Krishna, the gopis are most exalted. And out of all these exalted gopis, Srimati Radharani is the highest. No one can excel the devotional service of Srimati Radharani. Yeah. In fact, she's so amazing 
that Krishna became so amazed he couldn't understand, but but he just wanted to understand how is this person like this that he took the role of Lord Chaitanya, combined form of himself with Srimati Radharani to try to understand and not just understand but experience Radharani. What is it? What what is Radharani like? How does she think? How does she feel? What are her feelings of love? So Prabhupada mentions that there. And, you know, then, well, basically, paragraphs, what, eight and nine, are just kind of summing things up, really. Radharani's most exalted devotee, her kund, uh, is the most exalted place. We already went through that. And there's a verse which we read, I think we read, the other night when we're talking about Radha Kund. Uh, Radha Rani and Radha Kund, it's like that. Just as Srimati Radha Rani is dear to the Supreme Lord Krishna, so her bathing place, Radha Kund, is equally dear to Krishna. Among all the gopis, she alone stands supreme as the Lord's most beloved. So we'll go to, uh, not tomorrow, day after, we'll, we'll study more about Radharani and mention a couple of pastimes. I was going to get into a bit of a pastime here, but I fear we don't have enough time. Anyway, let me, let, let me just tell one pastime of Radharani which helps us appreciate her. It'll take, you know, five to ten minutes, so I think we have time. Okay, this is the story, if some of you may have even read it, of Prem Samput. Prem Samput of Vishwanath Chakravati Thakwa. And just to, to give you a little inspiration to start off with, at the beginning of it, uh, or is it the, maybe the end? Anyway, either the beginning or the end. Vishnath Chakravati Thakur says, Anyone who faithfully hears or describes this pastime of the Supreme Lord with the gopis of Raja attains supreme devotion to Krishna and quickly becomes free from the heart's desire of, of heart's disease of lust, becoming fixed in Krishna consciousness. So devotees, listen. One time Krishna decided he wanted to try to understand Radharani more. Now, he didn't take the form of Lord Chaitanya yet, but still, I mean, this interest to understand her has been there for some time. So what to do? Uh, he disguised himself as a demigoddess. And it's a bit of a long story, but we'll tell you briefly. This demigoddess then, totally disguised, came into the assembly of Srimati Radharani and the gopis, crying and crying and just crying. And she's such a beautiful young woman about their age. They, they naturally kind of accepted her and, and asked her, what's wrong? And like I said, it's a bit of a long story. Radharani says, you know, has your husband left you? Have you found a better man than your husband? <laughs> but now it's too late. Anyway, like this. But this girl, the demigoddess who's Krishna, uh, just won't, can't say anything. She's just too distressed. So Radharani is begging her, massaging her, trying to pacify her. Nothing is working. And then eventually the demigoddess says, all right, let me tell you why I'm 
so upset. I am so upset because, because I'm a demigod, I, demigoddess. I live up there. And I, can, and I can see everything that goes on down here. Yeah, I have, you know, the, the high view. And so I see how Krishna is unfaithful to you. This is what I see. Because I'm up there, I see it. He tells you he has to go home to meet Mother Yashoda. Ha, huh. I see. You don't see, but I see. He goes to meet another gopi. He cheats you. And I've seen it many times. And, and I'm so attached to you because you are such a wonderful, nice girl. I just cannot stand it that you're being mistreated any longer. So I've come to tell you about this and to tell you, you cannot trust him, reject him. You must reject him and find some decent young man. So it goes on like that. It goes on like that. But Radharani is saying, no, no, no. It's not really like that. But the demigoddess says, I've seen it many times. And Radharani gives some explanations that he only, if he goes to meet, meet another girl, it's only because she sincerely loves him and he feels duty bound. He has to at least have some exchange with, with her. But I know that he is fully faithful to me. You know, he's not involved with these other girls. It's just out of duty he's nice to them. So I know that. And the demigoddess goes on saying, but I've seen him do this and do that. And I, you, you must reject him. Go and do what I say. But Radharani is saying, no, no, no. No, I know that he's faithful to me. I know it. It's not just that I believe him. I know it. And the demigoddess, Krishna, says, oh, come on. How can you say you know it? Maybe you have strong belief, but no, you can't say that. And Radharani says, yes, I'm saying it. <laughs> I know he's faithful to me. And the demigoddess, Krishna, then presses her. How do you know? What makes you think you know? And Radharani, well, Prem Samput, the name of the book means the love locket. Yeah, locket, you understand? Yeah. The love locket. And Radharani says, all right, I will open up the love locket of my heart. And I will tell you, I will tell you why I know Krishna is faithful to me. I know because he and I are not two persons. We are one person. So, of course, I know we are one person. I must know everything about him. And the demigod says, oh, come on, please. <laughs> one person. You know, look, if you're really one person, if you're really one person, then just sit down, close your eyes and call him to come sort of like in meditation. Do that. And let's see if he comes or not. And if he doesn't come, then I know it's just, you're just sort of, you know, a, an excessively attached young girl. So Radharani says, all right. And she sits down and goes into meditation and closes her eyes and she is just calling Krishna, come now. And the, the power of her 
that sort of internal calling. She wasn't shouting or saying a word. The power of that overpowered Krishna and his disguise just fell off. And all the gopis saw, it's Krishna. But he told them, no, don't say anything. Don't say anything. So after whatever, some minutes or whatever it may have been, Radharani came back to external consciousness and there was Krishna right in front of her. And Radharani said to the demigoddess, well, she turned around to see the demigoddess, see, see, there he is. Oh, where's she gone? <laughs> and the gopi said, yeah, she told us she suddenly had to leave some important business <laughs> and she just left. But then Krishna just, choo, Krishna just appeared here and Krishna complained. What do you think you're doing? I was out there herding the cows. It's my service. I have to do it. And suddenly I felt myself just being dragged here. I couldn't stop myself. So, you know, you've created a disturbance in the, in the cow herding. It's not good. Anyway, like this. Then he kissed Radharani and, yeah. And they embraced and had some nice conjugal pastimes together. So you see, <laughs> it was a nice little pastime of Srimati Radharani with Lord Krishna. So devotees, uh, let me just read the last paragraph of verse 10. Therefore, everyone interested in Krishna consciousness should ultimately take shelter of Radha Kund and execute devotional service there throughout one's life. This is the conclusion of Rupa Goswami in the 10th verse of Upadesh Amrita. Now, I don't think we need to address the point that you should not go zipping off now once the uh, lockdown is finished zipping off to live at Radha Kund, don't do that. If you have a spiritual body, okay, you can do it. You have my, anyway, not permission or blessings, but you can just do it. If you don't have a spiritual body yet, just go there on Parikrama sometimes. And otherwise, here, wherever you are, South Africa, Russia, or wherever you are, India, just do your devotional service there. But, but some, from time to time, remember that most sacred place, Radha Kund, and that most sacred person, Srimati Radharani. Srimati Radharani Kejai.